turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look this morning together at Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. And as you're turning there, there is a famous quote that perhaps you have heard before by the church father, Augustine of Hippo, where he says this, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. I've been meditating this week, and it seems that restlessness as people might be the true global pandemic that has spanned every generation. And if the last year has proved anything to us as people, it has proved that where our true hope tends to lie, security and comfort, personal liberty and choice and things of that nature. And oftentimes what, what seasons of great stress reveal within our own hearts They reveal the areas and the things and the people and the systems that we tend to find rest and comfort in. Our hearts as people were created to worship, and they are forever drawn to worship. We are inherently religious as people as we seek to find fulfillment and meaning and value and and just about anything that will make us feel better for just a moment. I teach a world religions course, and the first two weeks of that class, what I try to instill deeply within my students is this point, that try as we might to avoid it or to not talk about it or to not think about it, all of us try to quiet that nagging voice in our souls through some sort of religious system meaning everybody that we know is religious. We all crave acceptance. We all crave hope and peace, security, meaning, assurance. We all try to quiet the voices of condemnation and guilt that seep into our minds and hearts, telling us that we're not enough, telling us that there's more to do in order to be fulfilled. And to be honest, the last year of isolation that many of us have experienced has kind of placed all of us on edge as we've grown in greater fear of a virus, or maybe we've become far too used to loneliness. Our routines have been robbed, our schedules have lost their security, and the niceness of what it means to be normal has gone away as all of us have tried to deal with lockdowns and restrictions and ceaseless opinions that float around on social media. You know, one of the classic questions that people like to ask is, who are you when nobody's looking? Who are you when nobody's looking? And honestly, this past year, that question is truly terrifying because if you're anything like me, you answer it, Well, the 2020 version of me is just not pretty. My friend said it best when he said, 2020, the year where nobody's at their best. As people, rest and peace are not our defaults. Even as most of the world right now is being forced to work remotely, to spend less time with friends or in social gatherings, avoid going out, Countless articles are coming out saying that many Americans are actually more busy than they've ever been. They're more stressed out than they've ever been. As work and home have been blurred, those lines have been blurred or or, or even obliterated. Maybe in the past year, as your community, the people that you spend time with and love, as those things have become less frequent, or maybe you've been absent from church gatherings, if you've had to quarantine, maybe you sense this increase of your own inner voice telling you, look, you just got to figure this out. 
or you just need to do a little bit more just to feel level again as an individual. One of the observations that I've had over the past year is just how addicted to performance I am. Just how addicted to performance we all truly are. I mean, be honest. We all like routines, don't we? We all like our neat systems, our clean lines. We like our meetings. We like our deadlines. And when those things go away, then who are we, really? A friend of mine, David Zoll, he says it like this in a book that he wrote. He says, performancism is the assumption, usually unspoken, that there is no distinction between what we do and who we are. He says, your resume isn't just part of your identity. He says, nowadays, your resume is your identity. As people who are chronically addicted to our own performance, weighed down with unfinished lists, burdened by unknown and unanswered questions of everyday life in a COVID-19 world, this morning there's really only one source that we attend to. There's only one well that we can drink from. There's only one bread to satisfy our hunger, and that's the person and work of Jesus Christ. Look with me at Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus offers this invitation to people weighed down. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In our men's group, we've been journeying through a, ver- through a book actually titled Gentle and Lowly. And we've been reflecting on this passage together for the past few months. In the 16th and 17th century, there was a group called the Puritans, and often they would write entire books, hundreds of pages of books on singular passages as they meditated on them, and they would wring it out, and they would get every last ounce from it. And that's what we're going to do this morning. As many of us perhaps feel weary or frustrated or even fearful concerning our own life circumstances, it's in these times that we look to our Savior. So in light of Matthew 11, 28 through 30, there's just a few things I want us to meditate on collectively and look at. And the first is this. Our Savior invites us. Our Savior invites us. Right away, what we see in verse 28 is that Jesus stands before all who will listen. Jesus stands before, before all who will listen. He says this. He says, come to me. And I want to make a clarification here. I want us to clarify this invitation. This is not a half-hearted invitation. You know like one of those times that you invite somebody to go out, and then somebody else hears it, and then you feel like out of your own guilt in Minnesota Nice, you need to invite them as well? And you're like, yeah, we're going out. I, I, yeah, you should, you, know, you should join us. Maybe you guys are all better people than I am. Far too often as Christians, we can operate with the idea that that's what Jesus does to us. That Jesus only invites us or he only initiates towards us out of this sense of duty. That Jesus actually really gets annoyed with how needy we are as people. Or that he really doesn't want us to come to him Because he's just tired of our sinning. He's tired of our personal issues. Many times it's easy for us to to view ourselves like that family member that nobody really wants at the Thanksgiving gathering, but you feel like you got to invite them anyway. But this is not the heart of Christ. This is not what drives or undergirds Jesus' heart for us as his people. Jesus does not invite us to come to him while in the back of his mind, hoping, I really hope they don't take me up on that offer. Dane Ortland says it like this, Jesus does not get flustered, and Jesus does not get frustrated when we come to him for fresh forgiveness, for renewed pardon, with distress and need and emptiness. That's the whole point. It's what he came to heal. Meaning this, 
It's actually our lack. It's our neediness. It's our inner guilt. It's our objective sinfulness. It's our problems and it's our ugliness that actually makes the gospel shine. It's what makes Christ most glorious because it's in these things that Christ's heart is actually drawn out to us. Jesus' open invitation to come to him is not like getting called down to the principal's office where he's going to give you a pep talk and a list of ways to be better and do better. The gospel of Jesus Christ is always an invitation that's filled with grace and it's filled with mercy and it's filled with forgiveness beyond what your heart can ever possibly dream of or fathom. Look at this. Jesus says, come to me. Come to Jesus. Come to a person. Jesus doesn't invite you to a system. Jesus does not invite you to a list of things to try harder at. It's not a list of things that we really need to improve on in order to be on the good side of Christ. Jesus' invitation to us is an invitation as one who actually understands you. His invitation to come to him is one who identifies with you. Jesus' invitation to come to him is to come to him as one who is not afraid of you. He's not afraid of your doubts and your fears and your insecurities. And this shows us who specifically is invited. Who's invited? All who are weary and heavy laden. In this posture of Jesus, there is one qualifier. There's one qualifier of who can come to him. There is one thing you actually need in order to come to Jesus and be accepted. And the one thing you need is to be needy. (laughs) That's what you need. To be needy. To be weary. To be weighed down and heavy laden. And this certainly doesn't mean that when you feel excited or hopeful or joyful about life or blessed that you can't go to Christ because certainly Jesus is the great one who weeps with those who weeps but who rejoices with those who rejoice. But what this does mean is that the most qualified person to accept the invitation to go to Jesus is the person who most deeply senses his need or her need of him. A good friend of many in this room, Christian MacArthur, he he, he wrote this for our church blog a few months ago, and he said this, the good news of the gospel is not that we clean ourselves up and muster enough belief to meet God halfway. The good news is that God takes on our humanity and meets us where we are. Jesus came into the world not to give himself to those who have it together, but Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost. What that means is that being weighed down by your own sin being burdened with the pressures of your own life, or even being frustrated with how things are panning out for you, that does not disqualify you from Jesus' invitation. That does not disqualify you from coming to Christ. Rather, it is actually those things and those postures that Jesus says in response to, come to me. That's why I came. Come to me. That's what I'm here for. I don't know what it is, but one of the things that I've seen in people, especially Christians, is we feel like so often we have to have some semblance of togetherness or at least really good motives to come to Christ. You know the area I see this the most in, not even in others, but in myself? And it's the area of spiritual disciplines. That when we neglect prayer, or when we neglect reading of God's word, we can get in this cycle of shame and guilt for not doing those things. And rather than going to Christ with that weight, we often tend to add more weight to ourselves, thinking that Jesus is really disappointed and that he's really frustrated. Y'all, the means of God's word and the means of prayer were never given to us 
to be a source of shame and guilt. It is a lie from the pit of hell to think that the solution to prayerlessness and the solution to more interest in God's word is to just buckle down and get more serious. To believe that is to believe that it is our discipline or it is our effort or it is our goodness that generates God's affections for us. The reading of God's word actually and prayer actually are given to us. Why? Actually to remind us and to point us and to drive us and to distill deeply within us just how deeply affectionate God already is for us in Christ Jesus. And so let me just say to you, the person who struggles with prayer, the person who struggles with guilt because they don't feel like they read their Bible enough, let me just say this. Stop. Stop it. That is not at all what God intends for you. God is not a giver of guilt. God is a giver of gifts. God is not a giver of shame. God is a supply of grace. Our words of prayer are meant to be pleas of mercy and grace. And God's words in this book are meant to be his answer to those pleas. And so when we plead for God's mercy to, to love him, to know him, what's his answer to those pleas? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And here is his gospel, his good news, his incredible promise. The last thing I want us to meditate on his promise that I will give you rest. Look at verse 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke, not an egg yoke, like I thought for so long growing up, a yoke was actually a wooden frame that you would place upon two oxen in order for them to work together. In Jesus' time, a yoke was also used as a metaphor of someone being subject to something else. Teachers would refer to their body of teaching or their way of life as their yoke. And this verse actually points us to the immediate context of the passage, that who is Jesus speaking to? Jesus is speaking to people who have been oppressed Jesus is speaking to people who have been harassed by teachers of the law and Pharisees who have extensively added to God's commands. Meaning the Pharisees, they took their weight, their yoke of teaching, if you will, and they placed it on their people. And they pushed them down. The people that Jesus is speaking to, they have been beat up and they have been abused and they have been weighed down with a list of commands that they feel like they could just never fulfill. Jesus is speaking to people who feel hopeless and insecure. But what Jesus offers these people is a yoke that is easy. He offers them a burden or a weight that is light. What is Jesus' teaching? What is that burden? What is Jesus' yoke that he places on our backs? You know what it is? It's him. It's himself. It is that the basis of our relationship with God is not us perfectly fulfilling commands of the law, but rather trusting and resting in the truth that Jesus always and forever perfectly fulfills the law on our behalf. It is the teaching that Christ gives us his righteousness, his perfection. His account is credited to ours by grace through faith. Obedience saves you. Obedience is what justifies you before God. But whose obedience? Jesus' obedience. Jesus' obedience. So some fresh theology today. Theology for breakfast. Theologians have coined a couple phrases. They call the passive obedience of Christ and the active obedience of Christ. 
And what that means is Christ's passive obedience means that in his death, his atoning sacrifice is what pays for our debt of sin. But Christ also has what's known as the active obedience. His active obedience is his perfect and sinless life that is credited to us by faith. So it's not only in the gospel that we are forgiven, but it's also in the gospel that we are counted perfectly righteous. Does this mean that we have to walk away from obedience? Not at all. It means that we can freely obey without the burden of the weight of the law on our backs. And why this is good news is this. When all that within us screams that we are not enough, when all within us screams that we are too sinful or that there is no chance for us, Jesus pushes through all of those voices, all of that weight in the gospel, and he says, you're not enough, but I am enough. You don't have any of your own righteousness, and that's why I give you mine. There is no hope in and of yourself, but I give you hope. I give you assurance. The Christian life, as much as we would like it to be about our performance and about our merit and about our effort, the Christian life is always about looking outside of ourselves to Jesus, resting in his merits on our behalf. As much as we are interested in presenting the cleanest version of ourselves, Jesus is actually always forever more interested in telling us, you are loved and you are forgiven. And so why does this matter this morning? Why do I bring us to Matthew chapter 11 other than the fact that we finished 1 Corinthians last week and next week is Advent and we needed some space to fill? I bring us here this morning because as I have reflected this week, as we're faced with more questions than ever, more uncertainty as we head into the winter months, I want to give you, as God's people, a fresh reminder of the greatest thing you need. The greatest truth that you need is that Christ is enough. When we are not, He is. Even as we struggle with our own disrupted routines and feelings of lack, Christ is enough. When many of us are stuck at home with nothing but loads of laundry and monotony and feeling like we are just not killing it in the Christian life, here's some good news. Jesus does not have some secret expectation of you that even in this weird and strange and scary time, his grace is sufficient for you. In other words, like this, Jesus has enough grace for the 2020 version of you. The impatient one may be that this year you thought you were patient and then like they took restaurants away and you realize you lose your temper a little bit quicker, Christ's grace is sufficient for you. The one who maybe during this time you've, you've slid back into habits that you're just not proud of, Jesus, his grace is sufficient for you. The mom who feels overwhelmed with responsibilities and challenges that you frankly just have not signed up for this year, his grace is sufficient for you. Jesus invites you the real you, the you that nobody sees, the you that perhaps you're just too embarrassed of, Jesus invites that you and says, that's, that's the one I want. Come to me. Jesus invites you, the real you, to lay down your performance and to rest and to trust completely in him. Jesus invites you, the real you, to take his yoke his burden, his righteousness, his grace, for his teaching is easy, his burden is light. And so let's just all be honest, right? We're not all at our best. We're not at our collective best right now. And while this may be true for so many of us, you know what it does? It gives us a greater opportunity to boast solely in the one who is always enough for us, Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel this morning. That when we are not enough, Christ is enough. 
that when we are not righteous, Christ is righteous on our behalf. That when we are full of sin, you are full of mercy. I pray for my brothers and sisters as they head into a week of thanksgiving where they celebrate your faithfulness, they celebrate the things that you have done for them in this past year. I pray that you would give them a gospel hope, a gospel thankfulness, that Christ is enough, that you are good, that you are kind, and that your steadfast love endures forever. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.